Where were the blues? Back to the white line. Four reds, three blues. Red. Blues, sorry, blues. Back to the white line. Red. Back to the white line. Okay, two reds, five books. Do it once more. White line. Two blues, five reds. Okay, just go back to the white line and stand there for a moment. What we see is in this minority game, very much like the traffic choosing between two routes, or the traders choosing to buy or sell, what we see is a progression in time, a pattern in time that doesn't really settle down. But it does kind of organize itself around this midpoint. So you're kind of organizing yourself. Now we're going to play another game. In this case, you've got to be in the majority. You've got to go with the crowd, okay? And you're only going to win sweets if you all do the same thing. So, let's get you going. Let's imagine that last time, blue was the majority. So blue was the winning decision. So, you ready? Majority, right? Go with the crowd. <laughs> Oh! Back to the white line. I owe you all sweets. Remember that. Back to the white line. Do we see a pattern emerging here? White line. White line. Okay, thanks very much. You can go back to your seat. Yes, I think it's great. So this pattern doesn't look anything like the last one. And most importantly, neither of these two patterns look like what would happen if we tossed a coin. In fact, if everybody had a coin and they were tossing it, to decide whether to jump to red, say, if it was heads, and blue, say, if it was tails. The pattern would have been quite different. What we're seeing here is a crowd effect. People are moving as a crowd. On the other hand, the coin, you see, has no memory. The crowd has a memory. That's why it locks into one result. Both red and blue are equally good. There's nothing wrong with either line. But one emerges as the winner for no real reason. Because there's memory in the system. That's the only reason. And we each have memory, and there's feedback between all of us. And somehow we act together. Unlike the coin that doesn't have any memory, can't remember the last heads or tails, and it acts independently every time you toss it. 
It's this understanding of how crowds behave that's actually important. Because everybody's acting individually with their own rules. Nobody's controlling the crowd. But for example, here, everybody managed to get across the bridge. Nobody tells them what speed to go at, but it's quite efficient the way in which everybody gets across. That's what people do. Animals have been doing this for a long time. In fact, ants are really good at doing this. Over here we have some food for these ants. The, house, the ants' house is over here. And they've got a couple of roots. And although there are some ants on this root, actually the crowd have actually found this root for some reason, maybe because it's wider, but it is a bit longer. But that doesn't matter. Ants, although they've got no walkie-talkies, there's no super ant telling them what to do. They haven't got any radio broadcasts. They find a solution to the problem of getting food and taking it back to the nest. It may not be the best solution, but it is a solution, and they found it reasonably quickly. And this idea of how, how to organize and how organization itself emerges in a population, almost like a kind of collective intelligence in a population, turning out to have great importance not only for organizing humans and understanding how ants work, but also even in arranging telephone networks. Telephone networks are very complicated. To have one computer that's controlling all of the data is really difficult. And if one part of the network goes down, the computer that controls it would have to contact all of the other data packets to tell them what to do. Far better to send each of these packets off like people or like ants with their own rules for deciding what to do and let the system decide. The system self-organizes. In fact, not only with data packets, also with organizations, organizations of people. Left alone, they do quite well at organizing. Maybe some of you feel that that would be the best way to run your school. I'll leave that to you. So what we've seen is that nature likes it on the knife edge between order and chaos. And so do we. We actually thrive there. But on that knife edge, there are no typical time scales. There's no sense in which something is due, like the bus. So maybe we might even speculate that this lack of a certain period or a certain time that events are due in given that we live our lives by a clock, is why we actually sometimes seem to kind of have conflict with such rigid timetables and structures and structuring of time itself. But of course, the only way to understand really about the future is to travel into it. And that we'll be talking about in the next lecture. Thank you. <laughs>